You are listening to The Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa, the fastest clothing in the world tour, the home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as they partner EF Education First and Canyon SRAM. Where are we, Lionel? We're Come on, Lionel, don't act surprised to say that every night. We're in our hotel, the Country Living St. George's Hotel in Harrogate. I've been pronouncing it wrong all week. I've been saying Harrogate. Oh, like we got somebody last night, actually. Well, let's hear him now. Any... That's how you say Har- Har- Harrogate. Harrogate. Any um, Agatha Christie related stories? <laughs> um, um, no, she, you she set murder on your in, she set murder yesterday. on your in Express here. Well, the the, the there's only uh, one mystery for Agatha Christie tonight is what what on earth is Matt White doing here? <laughs> oh, I'm a, I'm actually a tourist. This is the first time I've been to a World Championships without an official role, so yeah. I'm enjoying it. The uh, the 24 hours, 36 hours that I have here. <laughs> it might have been a bit longer um, no, if no the travel offic- arrangements had gone better <laughs> yesterday. Claims to have no official role, despite the massive appearance fee we're paying him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Matt is joining us at the Royal Hall tonight. We've also got Francois Tomazo here. Hi there. It's um, a bit, bit packed and crowded. We only have four microphones. Sorry about that, Francois. So, so you won't hear lots of me because I don't have a mic, but never mind. I'll listen for once. <laughs> Set your hand up if you've got something to say. Because of our event tonight, we're recording while the men's under 23 road race is going on so by the time this goes out we'll know the result and what's going on in it well let's have live updates there's been a few crashes don't yeah last, last time i looked uh, there was a remnants of the breakaway still away at 30 seconds about 50 kilometers to go but the peloton looked down to 30 or 40 riders so it's going to be probably a pretty select group by the time we get into town here and for the sprint how much, Matt, as, as our sports director, Mitchelton Scott, for those that don't know you, although everybody knows you, you know, how much attention do you pay to the junior road race and the under-23 race? And is, it, is there more attention paid on the junior road race now with so many young riders coming through? In the last couple of years, the game has certainly changed. There's no way in the world I would have looked, paid any attention to a junior men's road race unless I was watching the television, as, as far as scouting. Because, you know, until three or four years ago, what you would think uh, the junior level is a long way removed from where we're at in the world tour and there's been a couple of gentlemen in the last two years that have certainly changed i think a lot of people's perception of that given they are probably freaks of the sport uh evan pool is the number one example but uh, i did catch a little bit of the men's road race but uh, the under 23 race i've got three riders in that race that um that will be joining the team next year so keen to keep an eye on how those guys battle out the final but uh yeah i think we're paying more and more attention to the junior level ranks would you get a 17 or 18 year old in for testing, Matt, if you thought that they could maybe, well, do what Evan Nepal's done? Or? Yeah, look, in the past, because we had had a development team and the national team before was very, very connected with our team, there was probably no need to because uh, if there was any talented young Australians coming through, we knew who they were. You know, we'd probably have to wrestle them away from the track program. Uh, and there is some very, very talented guys in, in the track team at the moment who after next year's Olympics would all, I would like to have in a year, to, a year or two's time. But I think... Because we haven't got a development team, I think we're starting to look a little bit younger. And I think it's good to have relationships with the, those special ones coming through. Are you finding that those guys, the sort of hot properties, 19, 20-year-olds, they they've already got more offers and there's more competition for them than the once was? Even if they're Australian, there are already two or three teams who are approaching them. 100%. 100%. I, I don't think there was anyone contacting juniors not that long ago. I think you know, even two or three years ago, you could wait till two to eleven year and cherry pick the best uh, the best under 23s at Lavenir and like everything with with the with the, the rider market when it's when one team or two teams start looking earlier it actually forces other teams into doing the same thing I mean, we see the same thing happening with with countries don't we uh, Colombia or you know Ecuador now that and then agents will go in and they will sign up all the riders on their books is that is that happening too where agents and managers are signing up riders and, and sort of stimulating the market themselves and it becomes a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy that as, as one team does well, then an 18, 19 year old, other teams feel they have to too. Yeah, I, I think I think it is. I think uh, you know now the, the, everyone needs a South American climber on their roster, a young one. You know, and look, they're obviously producing a lot of talent out of South America, um, especially the Colombians. The Carapaz is obviously from from Ecuador, but yeah, it's it's it's, it's one part of the the puzzle about becoming a professional cyclist. And yeah, you know, even you look at the Americans have produced some great athletes in in the time trialing ranks over the last couple of years. But you know. Th- when was the last American that really did something here in Europe? It's been a long time. 
it's been a long time. I think what are the, some of the young Americans, they've found it difficult to assimilate living in Europe. I think, uh, and I think the difference to those guys, they still think America's home, and it's at that, you know, it's between six and ten hours to get home, and it's it's quite easy to get home. Where I think, as far as the uh, the Anglo's and who from the Southern Hemisphere, it's a, we can't once you're here, you're here for the season, uh, and I think it's been it's a, it's a mindset which I think we benefited benefited from. That uh, you're here for a job and you're here to race in Europe. And, you mean and for the Colombians as well? It's only six, yeah, seven hours. Yeah, I think it is. I think uh, yeah, the Colombians can go home, especially if they come from the, the altitude areas. They can go home when it, they don't really have a season there. So they can go home whenever they want in the season, as far as season, weather season. So you know, they can go home middle of the season, spring, autumn, wherever that may be. Do an out free altitude camp, stay at home and, and train on familiar roads. And uh, I think that's also when Europe is so close and, or when home is so close, easier to get away from, I think that also changes uh, how people look at uh, what's happening here in Europe. So I'd like your views on, uh, th there was a kind of a controversy, I mean, I, I, I had some, some disagreements with uh, Daniel but to, uh, in, in the Tour de France two years ago about, uh, because the, the old school view was that when you were a young rider, 20, like, you know, under 22 or under 23 or probably under 25 or 26, uh, it's, it's too early to launch you into the, into, you know, the, the, the big bath with the big boys and go for uh, major stage race and do you have the impression that Egan Bernal uh, Van der Poel or uh, Remco Evenepoel now are kind of uh, changing the rules I mean or destroying this the kind of certainties the uh, uh, old school uh, cycl cycling fans or cycling managers had do you think that the, the, the picture is changing a little bit yeah definitely and I know even myself I've questioned over the last couple of months you know I've been very very cautious over the last few years The, the not pushing young riders too much when they turn professional. But I still think it boils back to, you know, your Pochakar, Evan Poole, Van der Poel's a different story altogether. But those guys, they are the, the best of the best. And I think you can treat those guys a little bit different. But, you know, if you told me at the start of the season, you know, Pochakar was in two, a Tour de Nanda, I think he ran 13th or something at Tour de Nanda. And at, in September, he was third place in the Vuelta. He's had a very, very meteoric rise In, in, at a very, very high level. Okay, yeah, he won Tour de Lavenir last year, but Lavenir is a race of under 23s. Yes, it's a, it's a very high level race, but to finish third in the Welter and, and to finish off the Welter the way he did, are our, coaching, our coaches doing something different? Are they doing something different than we're doing? Are they just freaks? I, I don't know what the answer is, but it certainly has changed the way I think we've looked at young guys and maybe, maybe their development. Maybe we can be a little bit more, not pushy, but a little bit less protective of some of the younger guys in the future. Is there a risk with someone who comes to that level at 18, 19 and, and then gets into the professional system, whether in a trade team or effectively living and racing like a pro, but still being a teenager? The, uh, do you see the effects of kind of burnout or the effects of, of somebody getting 25, 26 years of age and they've already done six, seven years as a, as a pro? And also, do you think it will impinge on the opportunities for the late bloomers somebody who comes through and shows at 22 23 might be at a, a disadvantage of three or four years already yeah and I, i think what it does change for the later guys is people are certainly not looking for talented 23 year olds who might have missed the boat and i think that's that's also a mistake i think guys do develop at, at different rates and I, a lot of our younger guys i tried to tell them remind them don't compare yourself to the yates brothers you know, don't compare yourself to these guys just because they did this at, at 21 22 Just do it. Just progress at your own speed. And I, th I think that ethos has got to stay the same. But I think on my sort of behalf and with the management side of things, I think you can probably throw those young talent, especially the really talented ones, I think into the deep end a little bit more to see how if they do sink or, sink or swim. The main, the main thing is don't let them in the pool all the time. I think it's good to give them a lot of exposure to the high-level races and then it's case by case if they're ready to handle it and for how long. The fastest clothing in the world tour the home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Ratha in 2019 as they partner EF Education First and Canyon SRAM. Thank you very much to our title sponsor, Rafa. Very grateful as ever to them for their uh, support. And uh, well, guys, all the cycling chat is fine, is, is fair and good, but we have to talk about high tea. In Betty's, oh. <laughs> we were we were treated to the the full Betty's experience, and mm. it was well very interesting to see the reaction of Francois. Francois is an old hand, I think, at, at high tea. Um, but Daniel, never seen so Daniel so high uncomfortable. Tea, high tea and what was it? Uh, the high tea and um, what's the other tea. thing? Um, you no know, afternoon tea. What's the difference? Ooh. 
Is it not just uh, the same? Um, oh I'm goodness! We're off well, we, we had our, we had afternoon tea. We had a, a little glass of champagne and um, a, a pot of tea each, and then uh, the full selection of little sandwiches and scones and or scones or scones. <laughs> Uh, Daniel was out of his depth, though, wasn't and he? And then some macaroons. I found it very confusing, uh, the whole thing. I'm still it, reeling. If it, uh, but we're saying if it had been a similar kind of culinary, cultural experience in Italy, I'd have been you'd have been, you, you, you would have been. Choosing for eating the macaroons in the wrong order. Yeah. And, yeah. and the irony is you said the tea was nice. That was your verdict on it, wasn't it? Yeah, I was being polite. No, it was. It was. No, it was nice. It was. I mean, as high teas go, afternoon teas. I'm sure it, that was the, the gold standard. It seemed like so it. The best one you've ever had. Yeah, it was. Ma, Ma, did you enjoy it? I did. I did. It's the first time I've had uh, salmon with macarons, um, but <laughs> not the last. Not, say, not in the same mouthful. <laughs> um, but it is my first high tea as well. So it was a very pleasurable experience. Did you pick anything up that might transfer to race food? Stick them in a musette. Um, I think our nutritionist uh, will probably be against most of the things that we ate this morning, especially that butter you t- you showed me this week. The clotted cream. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's I, I it's fantastic. Think we need to get science in sport to do a clotted cream. Uh, just, just a clotted uh, cream gel. gel. <laughs> just a, uh, like a, bit, a bit of clotted cream in a Emergencies sachet. only. I think Emergencies on only. certain stages this year um, of major races in Andorra, when the hailstones came down or uh, the Giro, the Mortarola stage, I think a bit of clotted cream would have done guys a lot of good. Some rubbing them were, it on their... Uh, some, some of them were, <laughs> were too skinny for that sort of weather. <laughs> you, are, do, 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 you know, the reason why Richard Moore survives a landslide was, you know, uh, 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 as a kid, he had scones and uh, clotted cream. I'm, and yeah, I'm basically made, made of clotted cream. <laughs> But a big thank you to Dan at Betty's for inviting us. Um, really was a, it was a, well, it was a treat, wasn't it? It was a, it was a very, um, well, I'm still, I'm, it's nearly six o'clock and I'm still not hungry. Definitely the busy, busiest place in Harrogate, that, isn't it? Betty's. Oh, it certainly is. Um, yeah, and we met Lizzie Banks afterwards, the Great Britain rider, who gave me some very interesting uh, gossip, actually, which I'll share. Probably shouldn't, but... Um, Apparently, EF, Education First, and INEOS are both setting up women's teams. Apparently, that is the case. Oh, wow. Really? Apparently. That's that's especially great for INEOS because I think, uh, you know, there's been some of the best women in the world over the last decade have been British, uh, and there hasn't been a development team on their behalf, and it would be great to see... Uh, one of the powerhouses, if not the powerhouse in our sport, have a have a women's team. And I don't want to tell tales, Matt, but your rider Annemiek van Vluten was there as well at the next table. We did contemplate sending her a, a, a clotted cream uh, scone uh, as a little treat. When the um, sabotage her road race, but we didn't do that. When the Tour de France came to Harrogate, and the finish was well, the last 400 meters were the same in 2014. Um, I upset Mark Cavendish because he, he laid out his strategy for the sprint, where he was going to launch his sprint, and he told me he was going to go. He planned to go with 300 kilometers. Um, 300. Wow! Wow! Sorry, 300 meters to go. <laughs> he tried that at the Olympic yeah, road race. Yeah, that didn't work. 300 meters to go, and which was just outside Betty's, and I said, "Oh, it's wouldn't be the first time you've accelerated outside a cake shop." <laughs> <laughs> Matt, what are your early impressions of Harrogate as a as a as a venue for the World Championships? Yeah, good. Look, I was stayed under a kilometer here away from here when we hit the Tour de France, but I actually didn't look at town at all. Great venue, uh, and we'll see how the crowds filter in this later on this afternoon to watch the finish of the under 23s and I'm sure I'm sure it's going to be a busy day here on Sunday it's Saturday as well but it's the Blue Ribbon event on Sunday and I'm sure a lot of people coming in for the weekend from around Europe to, uh, to watch that one Shoot, uh, shoot at the du peloton cycling podcast team car at the back of the pack please That's Seb Piquet the voice of Radio Tour at the Tour de France interrupting our world championship coverage to remind me to tell you that this episode is sponsored by The Economist Now Richard we've been reading The Economist for many months now haven't we since they've been sponsoring the podcast and we've read on a range of different issues and found out that the magazine is about far more than just economics and finance and of late the economist has been turning its attention to the issue of climate change and a recent issue was dedicated more or less to that one subject um, because climate change is not an isolated issue is it It affects absolutely every aspect of our life and work and we've even started to see um, the impact of extreme weather events and things that have been caused by extreme weather events affecting bike racing this year haven't we notably at the Giro and the Tour yeah I mean it's something we talked about a lot at the Tour obviously we had stage 19 cancelled first time that's ever happened there was a landslide there were hailstones there was ice on the road had that as well in Andorra at the uh, Vuelta a España recently. The stage wasn't cancelled on that occasion, but it certainly had an impact on the racing. We saw the Gavia pulled out the, the Giro and also the Giro Rosa 
this year. Um, so we are we do appear to be seeing more and more extreme weather events. And here in Yorkshire, we've seen some pretty extreme weather too, uh, with the time trials on Tuesday in, particularly, in particular badly affected by very, very heavy rain. Well, the Economist, as you would expect, have taken a very kind of holistic, all-round view of the subject. And, well, Richard, when you were reading the, the climate change issue, uh, which came out a couple of weeks ago, I think, oh, actually last week, um, what caught your eye? Well, it's another subject that's kind of close to our hearts because as we travel around Europe, we like to sample the local food, of course. And this is a, a piece about what's called Fade to Brown, and it's about climate change destroying ancient olive groves in southern Europe. It, it concentrates particularly on in Puglia, uh, right down in the south of Italy, uh, where um, olive groves are being destroyed by a, a bacteria, which I'll not describe. I'll try, actually. Zilella fastidiosa. Whoa, we need uh, the pronunciation police on that one, don't we? But we do. Good effort. So it's carried by sap-sucking insects called spittle bugs. Climate change is not, the article says, the root cause of this outbreak, but it does explain the very rapid spread, or partially explain the very rapid spread, and it's really threatening um, olive groves throughout southern Europe. Um, climate change, says the article, is destroying or contributing to the destruction of ancient olive, olive groves across southern Europe. Europe, unusually hot summers and heavy rains in Greece have produced surges in the olive fly populations. The harvest there is expected to be down 35% this year. So it's a pretty bleak picture and a trend, a phenomenon that we're likely to see repeated. And as you say, Lionel, it has an impact on, obviously, all, all aspects of life, from what we eat to whether we can enjoy bike racing without without the threat of or the possibility or probability of interruptions because of extreme weather events. Indeed. Well, the Economist climate change coverage doesn't just stop with their special issue that they did. They're going to be covering the unfolding story of climate change in their daily and weekly reporting in the magazine and online and in their podcast films and at their events as well. And if you would like to see what the Economist has to offer and uh, what they say on a wide range of subjects, um, because The Economist is a smart guide to the forces changing your world. So if you're the type of person who never stops asking questions, you may want to get yourself a free copy delivered to your door by texting the word cycling to 78070. That's the word cycling and text it to 78070 for a free copy of The Economist. Yeah, Harrogate certainly seems busier today than it has at any point since we arrived on Sunday. Somebody was saying this morning that the bit of an absence of international fans but today I've seen the Belgians all in their red yellow and black hats uh, there were some Irish fans all um, walking in a line up presumably heading to Betty's and it feels like well why not everyone's heading to Betty's aren't they yeah um, it feels like the, the the world championships for the first time this week really a man walking past with a Yorkshire flag I don't think Yorkshire have got a team in this year have they people not yet. no they're well it's got a great sense of independence haven't they people from Yorkshire so it's only a matter of time the junior women's road race was this morning um, I watched quite a lot of that and it was uh, very well there was a lot of crashes a topic of conversation has been the how few laps they're doing of the finishing circuit here they didn't really do a lap they just came in to the finish the race was won by Megan Yastrab of the USA they're having a very good world championships she got away in the closing few couple of kilometres with Agul Gariva, I hope I'm saying her name correctly, the Russian girl who won the time trial the other day, and uh, she finished outside the medals in fourth because Yastrab got it just right. She waited and waited and waited and, and, and went and won the race, and uh, just as the, the bunch were closing. Silver medal went to Julie de Vilda of Belgium, and the bronze medal to Lika Nguyen of the Netherlands. Eleanor Backstead was fifth and then it was announced that she signed for Trek Segafredo for the next three years. Uh, we had a question in from a listener, Chris Yaxley, who said that in commentary, Rochelle Gilmore mentioned uh, a few times that the juniors race on restricted gears and Chris was wondering what that means. Now, my understanding of that uh, Matt, you might know better, is that the maximum sized gear that the juniors can ride is around about, is it 52.14? I think you're right. I so you're it right. works out at about... It used to be 93 inches. Yeah. And, and, and it was 52.15 when I was a yeah, junior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So basically, one revolution of the pedals in the bike's biggest gear mustn't exceed uh, that distance, at 96 inches. Uh, I mean, the, the regulation is clear, and it's obvious what gears you can and can't use. And the reason for that, Matt, I understand, is just to protect riders from <coughs> racing on just big gears and turning their development years into just a, a show of brute strength, developing a sort of cardiovascular aspect as well. Is that right? Yeah, I think it, it, it certainly favours that sort of aspect. And, you know, bigger gears also... So knee back problems when you're young growing athletes so to restrict the gears it's more about the aerobic system than just brute force whereas you know a big 16 year old on unlimited gears would be able to push a lot bigger gear than, than a smaller undeveloped uh, 17 year old so it's 52 14 now i just looked it up and um, but you can see that having an effect on you know some parts of the course obviously where it's fast and the the, the riders are just spinning out mm. um and that will be the case with the uh, uh junior oh no sorry the Junior men's road race was yesterday. We missed that. <laughs> Sorry, not really paying attention. We were away all day yesterday, of course. The gym, junior men's race. Yeah. Um, I heard a story about that earlier. The you know the Colombian the Colombian lad oh, who yeah. was left high and dry. Well, the, apparently he's not still there, is he? No, he's not still there. Um, Herman Becerra, I think his name was. One of the images, well, probably the image of the World Championship so far, he was crying at the side of the road. And then there were there've been various explanations from the Colombian mechanics. The, the Colombians, the, Col- Colombia. Um, had a team car yesterday. They shared a team car with the Uruguayans and the Chileans. So the team car was having to stop for the Chilean riders, the Uruguayan riders, the Colombian riders. Um, also, there were very splits at that point, and the Shim- there were, I think there were only two Shimano neutral service cars in the race, and and there was there wasn't one near um, the the young gentleman that was. I think he had. A, did he have a puncture at that time? Um, anyway, he removed his wheel and everything. Well, yeah. he looked very sorrowful at the time and was, you know, and was um, in floods of tears and was running up the road. But apparently, um, he was thrilled this morning because he had four thousand new followers on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> what a shame you weren't there, Daniel, with your mechanics expert expertise. Oh, yeah. You could have stood there and just sort of pointed vaguely. <laughs> Just pointing out because I read it as well on Twitter. He finished the race in 60th place, so I mean he didn't, you know, wasn't, he wasn't out of the race. He managed to finish, which is quite, you know, in a way impressive that he he didn't give up and you know and it was yeah away. it was very um, sad to think of the the distance he's travelled to to compete and. And and to see all the team cars just streaming past him, nobody helping him. I mean, there was a suggestion, probably silly one, that he was actually standing on the wrong side I of the thought road. That. And that well, he was, he was, he was, yeah. yeah, he was, yeah. yeah, yeah. And that that that's a problem that a lot of the riders have when they come to Britain. They stop automatically on the right. Did uh, Filippo Pozzato at the Tour of Britain one year not just refuse to cross from the? The right to the left, and and there was a standoff until eventually the mechanic had to <laughs> go and change the road changes. regulations in the <laughs> yeah. UK. Yeah. And also with the juniors, a lot of people don't realise that actually the parents end up paying for a lot of the junior world trips. Uh, not too many federations I know actually fully fund juniors. So yeah, it's a, it's a trip away, and some of these junior teams come over for two or three weeks, and you know, you're talking about up to ten thousand dollars to have your son or your daughter come and prepare for a world. So it is an expensive exercise, and no one likes to see. It's bad luck with anybody, but yeah, you know, especially with the juniors who are you know, riding their own equipment, uh, paying their own way probably to come here and uh, put a lot of effort, just as much effort in as, as the seniors. The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you very much to Science in Sport for supporting the Cycling Podcast and uh, offering 25% off for your clotted cream sachets. Not really, but... Um, uh, lots of gels and drinks and all sorts of r- sports nutrition products at sciencesport.com. Enter the code SISCP25. That's SISCP25 at sciencesport.com. Matt, who's going to win on Sunday? Oof. It's a tricky one. Oh, look, if I was betting on the race, which I'm not allowed to do, pretty hard to go past Matteo Vanderpool. Oh, I just think he's going to have a really strong team around him. The course is technical. I highly doubt it's going to stay dry for six and a half, seven hours. And I don't think there'd be anybody in this peloton who would be happy to go to the line with him in, in a sprint. And we know how good his technical ability is in the final. And uh, yeah, he's he's, a hard, he's going to be a hard one to beat. I think there's a few favourites, but for me, he's... Uh, and look, the freaky thing is with him, he's probably done 35 race days this year on the road. We're talking about as the favourite in the men's road race, a 20, 24, 25-year-old rider going in as a favourite with you know, a handful of cyclocross races, a handful of mountain bike races and 30-odd road races, and he's going in as one of the favourites. 
How do you see it from an Australian perspective then? Because the job presumably would be to try and get rid of Van der Poel and yet with the riders in the Australian team would want it to come down to some kind of group finish. So how do, how do they go about eliminating Van der Poel? Yeah, I think they've got Buckley's. The Australian team will be all in for Michael Matthews for sure. They'll use Haig uh, and Clark in counter moves in the last hour, I, w- I would expect. But they'll, they'll, the Australian team will be quite happy for a sprint with Michael Matthews um, because you know at the end of the day he'll, he'll probably run a drum there. But and and it is quite a good sprint for him, an uphill kick. Uh, it certainly favours a flat one. And but you know would Michael Matthews be confident of going to the line with Vanderpool? I, I doubt it. But uh, it, there's been worse finishes. But they're they're a team that would be happy for a, for a group sprint. And I, I don't I think they're pretty realistic. How do you do? How do you get rid of him? You're not going to get rid of him in the, in the crosswinds, and you're not going to drop him on the climb. So. Uh, they It'll can't even cut across the field. So, I mean, that would just play into <laughs> Van der Poel's hands, wouldn't it, as a cyclocross world champion? Matt, a lot's been made of the distance, the longest world championships ever. Um, I think it's going to be you know, pretty kind of grippy roads as well. Yeah, what, what can you do and what do riders do when they know that, OK, they're going into a 290-kilometre race instead of a 260-kilometre race? How much extra work on that aspect of the race goes in in the few weeks before are guys extending their training you know their long their long days um for another hour or what will they be doing yeah i, I don't think so i think let's compare tomorrow with milan san remo distance wise time on the bike probably the same tomorrow will be a harder race as far as meters climbing that's for sure but the guys not too many guys training above that six hour mark at all and i've been looking at the training of some of our guys who are riding here and they're, they're still p- plugging away there your four to five hours and i think it'll be it's going to be 300 kilometers nearly with with neutral mm. but there hasn't been any races i don't think over two i think plu a was probably the longest race that, that anyone's had in the last uh, in the last month i don't think any of the stages in the welter were six hours plus uh and plu a was 250 They'll ha- they handle it. They handle it. And I don't think there'll be too much change. I think the big thing, if we've got a foul weather day here, is just staying warm, uh, especially early in that first three to four hours. If you, if you can stay warm, stay protected from your teammates, it makes a big difference. And now the clothing that is available to the guys, it's it's a big difference from not that long ago. Uh, the quality of clothing makes, makes a huge difference if you're in the saddle for six to seven hours, which they're going to be on Sunday. Well, we better get ourselves over the road to the Royal Hall Theatre where we're appearing this evening, all of us. If you're coming along, well, you'll already have seen us by the time you've heard this. I hope you had a nice time. We'll be back again tomorrow to recap the women's road race. Uh, Thank you very much for joining us, Matt. Uh, Pleasure. Thank you, Francois. Thanks. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you. And thank you, Richard. Thank you.